Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for joining. Today on The Dizzle Carlson Show, we have a lot of news to get into. One of the biggest holdings in my portfolio, which is Microsoft, is up 4.5% today after its earnings report yesterday and some very good guidance from this company. Now, I looked through Microsoft's earnings report in detail. I spent the evening last night going through it, as well as all of their operations of their business, and I thought it was fantastic across the board. I am excited to go through this earnings report with you because I thought it was incredibly strong. And I went through and highlighted some of the most important things regarding this report. Now, another company that's in a growth portfolio of mine is Google, and it's up 5.9%. Google's earnings report, in my opinion, was more of a mixed bag. There were certainly some good parts of it. There are some things that I liked but also some things that I thought were pretty concerning, some concerning trends with Google. So we're gonna go through those as well, and I'll give you my overview of Google's earnings. And then of course we have Meta as well, the biggest social media company. I'll be giving you my instant reaction to Meta's earnings report as well. Now, before we jump into these earnings report, I think it's time for a quick update on my portfolio. For those of you new to the channel, we get thousands of new subscribers every single month. Welcome to the channel. This is a channel about real money with real transparency. Most people on YouTube do not share their full portfolio every single week, week by week with transparency. And that's something that I've tried to emphasize on this channel to encourage it more because most of finance is people telling you what to do with your money, but they don't show you what they're doing with theirs. I take the opposite approach here. I do not tell you what to do with your money, but I show you what I'm doing with mine. Right now I have a portfolio of $345,000. The majority of this is building up, depositing, and reinvesting dividends over the past three years. Right now, The gains are only $28,000, which is a 25% money-weighted return. Around half of that is dividends, $15,000, and half of that is market gains. This fluctuates a lot. At the beginning of this year, my gains were $80,000, so I'm down around 14% year to date. Now, regardless of the short-term fluctuations, what I try to do here in this portfolio is focus on what I consider to be very high-quality companies. High-quality is an ambiguous term. It can mean basically anything. Everyone has a different definition of what high quality means, but I have a very specific definition of what I think high quality means. And what I did was I put this definition into a checklist. I call it the compounder checklist. I'm going to throw this on the screen for you and we can go through just a couple things here. The first thing is looking for companies that have strong franchise durability. They have diversified brands. They have brand recognition and pricing power. Companies that can easily raise prices on their products without consumers switching to alternatives. Companies that have high free cash flows. I'm typically looking for companies that have a 4-6% to free cash flow yield. Right now in the equity markets, around 40% of companies are not free cash flow positive at all. Not even a little bit especially when you account for stock-based compensation. But every single company in my portfolio is highly free cash flow positive, even factoring in stock-based compensation and dilution. Number three is I consider high quality companies, compounders, to have minimal financial leverage, meaning their net debt is less than three times their EBITDA. That's in a simple counting rule to see if a company has good liquidity. Number four, and this is a new consideration to my portfolio, this is a new factor I'm looking at, it's non-cyclical. I like earnings to have low variance and grow all the time, including during recessions and inflation. Costco's an example of that. If you look at Costco's earnings per share chart, it simply grows all the time, even during recessions, even during inflation. High quality compounders have recurring revenues. Every single one of them has recurring revenues. This doesn't necessarily mean subscriptions, it just means the product and services are essential. They're repeat purchases, and they can't be substituted. We want to look for companies where the lives of the products can't be extended during recessions, like auto manufacturers, for example. If you go into a terrible recession and people don't have money, they're not going to be upgrading their cars. They'll just keep repairing and hanging on to their old vehicles. So we want products that expire, that they go away, and they're completely necessary to have repeat business. And then number six, I look for companies that return capital back to the shareholder. This one is vital. I look for companies that pay a growing dividend. This is in some sense a dividend growth portfolio, but I also look for companies that do buybacks, preferably companies that are doing both. The more money they're returning back to the shareholder, the better. And if the company does reinvest, they better do it at a very high rate of return. So these six points are my compounder checklist. This is what I look for in high quality companies. Now, when we look at one of my companies here, Microsoft, I believe, 
checks every single one of the boxes in that checklist. And the earnings report of Microsoft, I believe highlights how good of a compounder this company is. In every sense, Microsoft is still a compounder company. Now let's go ahead and jump into the Microsoft earnings report and let me highlight some of the most important parts of this report. The first thing that I wanna point out is the growth of Microsoft. This is a fast growing company. And this is something that a lot of people can't wrap their heads around. Because Microsoft is a massive $1.95 trillion market cap, that is an incomprehensible amount of money, 1.95 trillion. And because it's so big and massive, a lot of people incorrectly believe that the growth will slow down. They say Microsoft can't keep growing at an attractive rate forever. And because of the law of large numbers, it must decelerate rapidly. That hasn't been correct. And the people that repeat that don't understand that the law of large numbers needs to be expanded when accounting for internet enabled companies. This isn't the 1950s. They're not just marketing to the US and to a small civilization. Microsoft markets to the entire globe. It's a highly diversified business that has its hands in every corner of the world. Microsoft's revenue grew 12% last quarter year over year to $51.9 billion. It was 16% in constant currency. Constant currency means that if you didn't account for the US dollar becoming stronger and Microsoft earning a lot of its revenues outside of the US, so the conversion rate lowering their revenue, they would have grown 16%. That is fast growth, especially in this environment. Microsoft is one of these companies that has a durable franchise brand, the Microsoft business suite, that they do have pricing power and they have recurring revenues. This company checks off every single one of those boxes in the checklist. Their operating income was 20.5 billion, 14% in constant currency. Their net income increased by 2%, up 7% in constant currency. This is fast growth across the board. Their diluted earnings per share was $2.23, up 8% constant currency. Now in this report, they talk about their cloud saying commercial bookings grew by 25% and Microsoft cloud revenue was up 25 billion, up 28% year over year. Now don't confuse Microsoft's broad cloud-based products with Azure. They put those in two different categories. So their Azure business grew much faster than 28%. This is just in general, their entire cloud business. But continuing on, when you actually look at a breakdown of Microsoft's growth, it's incredible that every single segment of the company, virtually all aspects of it, minus a couple, are growing at very attractive paces. Productivity and business processes was up 17% in constant currency. Office commercial products and cloud services up 13%. Office consumer products and cloud services up 12%. LinkedIn revenue up 29%. Dynamics up 24%. Again, all of these were impacted by the currency exchange rates, but these are good numbers. Now we get to the cloud business. The most important part of Microsoft, the key focus of the company and the CEO is Azure. And the cloud services and Azure's revenue was up 40% but up 46% in constant currency. So this did get impacted a lot by the currency exchange rate, but without that factored in, 46% growth in Azure is incredible. They're growing this at such a fast clip, faster than any other cloud company, including Google. In constant currency, this is at the same clip as last quarter. Now we get to a couple lowlights here. We have some parts of the business that actually shrink. Windows OEM revenue decreased by 2%. Windows commercial products and cloud services increased by 12%. Xbox content and service revenue decreased 6%, down 4% in constant currency. To me, this makes sense. We just got through some incredibly tough comparables for the Xbox content category. Everybody was gaming and buying games a year ago when they were locked in home. Now they're going out and going on vacation. So having this be basically flat, a little bit of a decline, not preferable. We want Xbox and the gaming portion of Microsoft to continue to grow. And I fully believe in the future, it'll continue to grow. But right now the comparables and the environment is too difficult to compete with. So the gaming section did shrink a bit year over year. Their acquisition of Activision Blizzard will help with this in the future. Now search in the news advertising revenue, excluding traffic acquisition costs was up 21%. Service revenue increased by 15%. These numbers are crazy good all across the company. And then Microsoft did another thing on the checklist. They returned $12.4 billion to shareholders in the form of share repurchases. Those are buybacks and dividends in the fourth quarter of 2022. That was the previous quarter. 
an increase of 19% compared to the fourth quarter of the fiscal year of 2021. So Microsoft is returning capital directly back to the shareholder, you and I. Now, one thing I'll note on the subject of buybacks is it's a little disappointing to see how much money a company like Microsoft can spend on buybacks and how little the share count goes down. For example, they spent $12 billion on buybacks last quarter, and the share count went from $7.49 billion to $7.47 billion. So it only went down almost a quarter of a percentage just a quarter of one percentage with $12 billion spent on buybacks. And over a longer timetable, since 2018, the share count is only down around 2.8%. So their buybacks are, are not being too effective for this company, considering that they have so many employees to pay. And they don't say in this release how many employees they have, but I assume that number is going up and it's offsetting the effectiveness of the buybacks. So overall, this quarterly report did exactly what I wanted it to do, not change my opinion about Microsoft at all. My opinion on this company remains firmly unchanged. It is a strong franchise company that has multiple brands that have massive pricing power. It has high amounts of free cash flow. The company having a 3.3% free cash flow yield while generating the growing amounts of free cash flow they are on a consistent basis is very attractive. Their net debt to EBITDA is far less than three times. In fact, they have no net debt. They have net cash of 46 billion. And then in terms of reoccurring revenue, this company is the definition of reoccurring revenue. Around 85% of Microsoft's revenue is subscription-based. It's from companies that have to survive using their software, and they're very unlikely to cancel. They can't prolong the billing cycle. It's very difficult for them to pay Microsoft less money during a recession. And then as we've seen every single quarter with this company, they return cash back to the shareholder. They do it through a growing dividend, and they do it by buying back shares, which they did this past quarter. Microsoft remains a high quality compounder, and in my opinion, at an attractive price. Next up, we have Google. This company's up 5.9% today, along with Microsoft and Meta. They're all doing really well right now. Now, before we jump into Google, I have to give a shout out to today's sponsor of this video, which is FTX US. You can download the app or sign up on desktop. There's a link in the pinned comment of this video. And they're gonna be releasing their stock version of this very soon. I have a little portfolio that I started buying the Amazon dip. We'll see how this goes over the next earnings report. I have some money, a little bit of money sitting on the side, $2,000 for if Amazon has a huge dip after their earnings. So some part of me is wishing that it goes down and I can buy up that dip, but we'll see. Either way, FTX has a stock brokerage here. They're doing improvements to it all the time. It's simple. You can buy and sell anytime the market's open. They have fractional shares. It's part of FINRA and SIPC insured. You can sign up for free right now using the link in the pinned comment. And when you do, make sure to use the referrer code Carlson, my last name. That lets them know that I sent you, so it helps out the channel. And it gives you $10 upon your first $100 stock trade. So go ahead and sign up now. Let me know what you think. Google's one of the companies that a lot of investors have considered to be heavily undervalued because it's under that nice line. It's under the 20 PE ratio at a 19 Ford PE ratio. Now, I own the company in my growth portfolio. I think it's incredible. Obviously, as a YouTuber, I think YouTube is one of the best assets in the world. But having said that, I get a little concerned when growth rates go from 15 to 20 percent for year after year after year. And then one year because of a random event, because of something uncontrolled for a pandemic, the operating income of the company instantly doubles in one year's time. That's something that I think is abnormal. And just in my common sense, just some simple thoughts here, when the operating income goes up double for a company way abnormally, I think there's a chance it could revert back to the mean a little bit. And that's exactly what Google's doing. The operating income spiked up so much that we're starting to see that reversion to the mean. So let me go through some of the report here and then we'll look at some charts and some numbers. There's a lot to Google's report that I think is important to go over. The first thing that they highlight, and this is Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google, he says, quote, in the second quarter, our performance was driven by search and cloud. The investments we've made over the years and AI computing are helping to make our service particularly valuable for consumers. Sundar is very smart. He knows the edge that he has in cloud computing. Every company, every big tech company, meaning Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, 
all have different advantages in cloud. Personally, I think that AWS is the most rounded, it has the biggest lead, and it will likely maintain the largest size. I think the only one that could eclipse it is Azure. They're the only one with the capability of doing that. But I don't think that Google's efforts in cloud are in vain. I think they're doing a good job here, and they are currently the best at artificial intelligence. Google has a huge advantage because they've been in that field, that category for a very long time. So they're leaning into the AI on their cloud computing. That's something we'll get to later in this report. Now let's go ahead and look at a breakdown of the growth rates of the individual aspects of this company. They didn't do the math, so I went through and added this up. Google search grew by 13.5%, which is incredible to me. All the companies struggling with ads right now, Google proved that their ads are far more resilient than other companies, where Snapchat and others are saying ads are slowing down, even on LinkedIn and other companies are saying they're slowing down. Google says we're still growing, 13.5%. YouTube ads though, however, have decelerated heavily, 4.8%. That is extreme deceleration in ad revenue year over year. When you factor in inflation, that's actually losing money because inflation is at 9%. Google's growing their ad revenue at 4.8%. They also grew expenses for their advertising business. So right now, as of the past year, Google's ad business is basically flat. And this is what I've seen on YouTube. The ad business has taken a hit on Google. So if you're invested in the company, I still see it as a bullish investment over the next 10 years. I still think that YouTube somewhere through halfway its total growth arc, I think a lot of children these days are growing up on iPads, watching YouTube videos, watching TikTok. I think cable TV, all these different networks and legacy architectures of entertainment, I think they'll fade away with time. And YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Reels, all that type of stuff is the future. So even though YouTube had massive deceleration in revenue growth this last year, that's mostly because of extremely tough comparables to the year prior where we were in a pandemic and all anyone could do was watch YouTube videos. CNBC notes that YouTube has an obvious math problem as growth rate slows dramatically from pandemic highs. In terms of the comparables, they say that it grew at 4.8%. That's correct. A year ago, revenue jumped 84%. So we went from 84% growth to 4.8% growth. And I believe now YouTube has a tougher path ahead. They have TikTok that they have to compete against. They have Instagram, moving into Instagram Reels, and they're putting a bigger focus on that. YouTube has to compete with them. They have to compete against all the streaming services moving to ad base, including Netflix. So YouTube has more ad competitors, more social media competitors, but I still think it has a very unique niche as being the best in terms of long form content. So overall, I'm still bullish on YouTube, but I don't see it growing 80% year over year like it used to. Their other bets, which is a small portion of the company, is down 1.1%. This is basically a black hole for money. We don't really know what it does, except for lose some money every single quarter. Now we have Google Cloud, which of course is an important part of the company. This really contributed a lot to the top line revenue growth. It was growth of 35%. Now I can't find if this is including FX exchange or not. So I don't know if this includes currency exchange or how much that affected this number. But what I can conclude is this is slower than Azure. So even though Google Cloud is much smaller than Azure, it's growing at a much slower speed. And this is why I say it is difficult to compete with AWS and Azure. I do not see Google Cloud doing it. I don't see IBM doing it or Oracle. I see Azure and AWS in a class of their own. All these companies will continue to grow their cloud efforts, but I believe that it will continue to be a very top heavy industry. Now, one thing that I don't like to see in Google's report, and I actually thought that this was weird and somewhat concerning, is the massive amounts of employees the company's hiring. Year over year, they went from 144,000 employees to 174,000 employees. So they increased the employee headcount by 20.8%, which is an additional 30,000, above 30,000 employees year over year. They increased employee count at a faster rate than their revenue growth and their income growth. They're growing employees faster and faster. And this is a tech company. It's supposed to scale. It's supposed to be efficient. Why are they hiring 30,000 employees in one year? And I know what a lot of people are saying when they listen to this. Oh, Joseph, those employees are good assets. They'll help out the company. They'll help it grow. They'll build new things. That's good in theory. Maybe they will do that, but I have a hard time believing that they need this many employees. I think some of these hires are very unnecessary. And to investors, this is important to note. This is important to pay attention to 
because employees are paid partially. A good part of their compensation is stock-based compensation. With the huge majority of those 30,000 new employees getting stock-based compensation, that means that Google has to issue more and more shares every single quarter to pay those employees as part of their compensation. Now they do share buybacks to get rid of that stock-based compensation effect, but what this does is make their buybacks less efficient for the company because they're buying back shares that they issued for the employees. So the money that they pour into buybacks is getting eaten up by employee dilution for their stock-based compensation. We can see this in the shares outstanding over time. Google's considered to be this big buyback company that pours billions and billions of dollars into buybacks every single quarter. And they do, they pay a lot for buybacks, but look how much the shares outstanding are actually going down. In 2018, the shares outstanding were 13.91 billion. So 13.91 billion. Then last quarter, they were 13.1 billion. That is a 5% decrease over that period. Only 5% decrease with the amount of money that Google's pouring into buybacks. Last quarter, Google poured $15 billion in buybacks. $15 billion they bought back of their company, and the company generated in that period $12.5 billion. So they actually did more buybacks than their company made in free cash flow. They're pouring money into buybacks, but the amount of shares outstanding is going down at a slow pace because of how many employees they have. They just keep issuing more and more stock to additional employees, making these buybacks less effective. To look at an alternate example, a company that does not have a lot of employees that do stock-based compensation, we can look at Domino's. Over the same time period from 2018, Domino's went from 42 million shares outstanding to 36 million shares outstanding. So Domino's share count has gone down 12%. So Domino's is doing buybacks at roughly twice the pace of Google, simply because they don't have all those employees to pay. So right now I view this as a big expense. I wonder why they're growing headcount at such a rapid pace above other big tech companies. And that is hitting the bottom line for investors. That does cost each one of us money if you're invested in the company. Now, the other part of this report that I wanna highlight is something we know already. This shouldn't be a surprise, but it's still somewhat concerning. They lose money on a lot of different things that they go into. One of them is cloud services. They're still losing money on their Google Cloud. They still lost $858 million. So Google Cloud is a money losing business right now when Azure is highly profitable and AWS is highly profitable and both of them are likely growing as fast or faster than Google Cloud. So Google still has a lot of ground to make up with this cloud bet. I think it's worth it. I think this is a good business to be in, but right now it's not contributing much. The other part of this is other bets. This is where they try to come up with something new, innovative. Most of the time this just burns a billion or $2 billion per year. So it is another thing that hits the bottom line. Other bets should try to contribute something that has a good return on invested capital. Otherwise, Google is burning your money. So I see Google as a bit of a mixed bag here. The company's up big today because it survived. It dodged a major bullet, the ad spend. The most important part of their company is still growing. So they haven't hit the ad apocalypse yet. They do have a lot of contenders, a lot of competing businesses in this category. But as long as that aspect of the company remains strong, this stock will continue to go up over time. And the other aspects of this report, I would just say were okay. They're not amazing. They're not like Microsoft across the board, but they were passable. And we are starting to see a little bit of that reversion to the mean that we talked about here. This growth was abnormal. It is gonna revert to the mean a little bit, but over the long term, the long term trend should still continue. Now, moving on, finally, we have Meta, Facebook. In full disclosure, I own $2,000 worth of this company in my growth portfolio. So it is a very small percentage of my total invested net worth. It's a small percentage of that growth portfolio. And this is a company that on paper is very cheap, but they just reported their quarterly earnings. Let's go ahead and take a look. All right, so this literally came out five minutes ago. This is an instant reaction. Let's go ahead and look at this. We'll skip the introduction here. Uh, let's go ahead and look at some of the numbers here. Total revenue. The total revenue was 1% less than 2021. So we have it here on the left. It was 28.8 billion. And then last year it was 29.07 billion. So a minus 1% of total revenue, total costs and expenses. Now the total costs went up around 4 billion or 22%. So far, right off the bat, I hate this report. The revenue went down 1%, but the cost of revenue, the cost to run the company went up 22%. 
not good numbers by comparison. I've been already talking about different companies growing their expenses too quickly, especially compared to their revenue. Right now, Facebook or Meta has no revenue and they're growing their expenses at a very brisk pace. Let's go ahead and move on though. Maybe this will get better. Maybe that was just a low light. Income and operations, it went from 12.36 billion to 8.3 billion. So the income from operations went down 32%. The operating margin contracted dramatically from 43% to 29%. The provisions and income tax, okay, we don't really care about that too much. Effective tax rate, don't care about that too much. The net income from 10 billion to 6.6 billion, a 36% reduction. Diluted earnings per share of minus 32%. These are almost unreal how bad these numbers are. This is a bit surprising to me. I thought that Facebook would manage a bit better than this, but it's clear that, again, Google stands as a unique company able to keep their ad business strong when other ones can't. Snapchat is having a difficult time, and Meta is having a difficult time. I don't know what to say. This is terrible. This earnings report so far, before we even get into some of the key metrics here, this earnings report is awful. Family, daily active people, DAP, was $2.88 billion on average an increase of 4% year over year. That's a big win. They have to get daily active users up year over year. If this number was negative, I think this would be catastrophic. And I haven't looked to see how the market's reacting to this. I'm assuming negatively so far. We'll see what their guidance is later on. But this is one positive point. At least their engagement, the people on the app every single day seems to be increasing. Family monthly active users was up 4% increase year over year. Facebook daily active users, increased 3% year over year. Facebook monthly active users increased 1% year over year. Ad impressions and price per ad. In the second quarter, ad impressions delivered across the family of apps increased by 15% year over year, and an average price per ad decreased of 14% year over year. So this part right here is the ad apocalypse we're talking about. Ad rates are going down. Facebook is feeling it right now, but they are converting well. They're getting back on track, adjusting from the Apple changes. This right here is certainly a highlight. The engagement likely will cause it so maybe Facebook doesn't have a dramatic sell-off. Based on these numbers up here, this is terrible. If they also had lower engagement while posting these, these horrible numbers across the board, I would assume it would have a massive sell-off, 10 15%. But this right here may save it, I'm not sure. If we look at the after hours right now, Facebook was up 6.5% on the day and it's given up the majority of its gains, it's down 4%, but this doesn't look catastrophic. Investors are still going through it right now. It's still very fresh. We'll see what they make of it in a minute. Let's continue on. Their capital expenditures, including principal payments of finance leases, were $7.75 billion for the quarter of 2022. They said, we repurchased $5.08 billion in a class of common stock in the second quarter of 2022. And then as of June 30th, 2022, we had $24 billion available and authorized for repurchases. The cash on hand is $40.49 billion. Headcount was $83,000 as of June 30th and an increase of 32% year over year. So let me get this straight, Meta. If we're shareholders of this company, you're telling us that they increased headcount by 32% in a highly competitive industry where every single one of those employees are going to need stock-based compensation and very competitive salaries. 32% when the company grew minus 1% in total revenue just disastrous. Total expenses are going through the roof and the company's not growing. Now let's look at some segment results here. This is where they break it down by the different portions of their company. We have advertising that it looks like it's not really growing year over year. Advertising actually went down from the previous year. Google is an outlier. They're performing better than Facebook, better than Meta. Reality Labs went from 305 to 452. Then we can look at the losses here. Reality Labs cost the investor $2.4 billion in 2021, that quarter. Now it's costing us $2.8 billion. So this is still a very expensive endeavor that's losing money for the company. Now, the thing that's most concerning about this earnings report amongst a lot of concerning information I'm looking at is probably this free cash flow line right here. You can see that their free cash flow in 2021 was $8.5 billion. $8.5 billion and now it's $4.45 billion. 
So the free cash flow went down roughly $4 billion from the same quarter one year ago. Now on Qualtrim, we have extremely fast updates on our earnings report. This is already imported into the website. You can see the latest quarter here, $4.63 billion in free cash flow compared to the previous quarter of $8.64 billion. This is what it looks like. And we have this similar trend. Free cash flow is generally climbing over time. And then we're seeing this fast deceleration, this fast pullback in free cash flow. Now, what was it that cost the investors so much cash flow this quarter? It looks like the incremental spend was mostly attributed to purchase of property and equipment. So they spent a lot of money reinvesting in property, maybe new office space, stuff for reality labs. They did a lot of purchases last quarter, which really crushed that free cash flow metric this quarter. So personally looking at this, I don't like this earnings report at all. And I say that as a shareholder of Meta, I do have a little bit of this stock. The company is cheap. That's basically the thing that it has going for it. It is a cheap company. It has a high free cash flow yield, but let's look at some of the numbers here. These are updated as of last quarter. The revenue has gone down from four quarters ago. It is down 1%. So the company's no longer growing, it's X growth, and it's going to have to work on reaccelerating growth. The EBITDA is likewise in a general trend downward now. It's not holding up well with the adpocalypse. The free cash flow, as we've seen, both on a nominal basis and in free cash flow per share, we have a reversion back to the mean. It's going back down, at least right now, unless they get very strong guidance of the future, this is a concerning trend. The net income, the same thing, it seemed to peak around 2020, 2021, starting to go back down. The earnings per share, the same thing, it's going down 30% year over year. That is a massive loss in earnings per share. And even their balance sheet, which historically has been one of the strongest points of this company, looked a lot better just a year ago. A year ago, they had $64 billion in cash. They had $10 billion in debt. Now they have $14.7 billion in debt and they have $40 billion in cash. So even after these metrics are moving in the wrong direction, the same thing with their balance sheet. It's still incredibly strong. This is a great balance sheet, but look at the trends over time. Cash is going down, debt is going up. They are doing share buybacks pretty aggressively, but they don't have the free cash flow to continue supporting those share buybacks without dipping into their cash or using debt. So they're not able to dedicate quite as much money as we'd like to see to share buybacks. But even so, because Meta is such a cheap stock, it trades at such a high free cash flow yield, it has such a low PE ratio, that when they do buybacks, because their shares are so cheap, the buybacks go a lot further. And they were able to reduce their shares outstanding by around 0.7% just over the past 90 days. That's better than Google or Microsoft by a long shot. So the share buybacks should be a very strong part of the thesis if you're a meta investor. And then finally, I think the most concerning part for all of these companies, but especially meta, is the amount of increase in their expenses, their capex, their employees, their stock-based compensation, without the amount of increase in their revenue and growth. Look at the capex spend of this company. It's going up like crazy. Last quarter was $7.57 billion. Then we have sales and marketing. This portion of the company is also growing, not quite as fast. At least this isn't going out of control. We can look at the general administrative. This has gone up to 2.9 billion last quarter. And then research and development, this is the part where Mark Zuckerberg is focusing on reality labs, something unproven that in my opinion is somewhat of a long shot. This is at $8.69 billion in a single quarter. That is very expensive to put that much research and development in a single quarter. And again, the concerning thing here is that this chart here of their expenses is going up like a fast growing company, while simultaneously the chart of their revenues has basically topped out. So I don't know about this one. In my opinion, this was not good earnings, not what I like to see. These numbers right here are awful. The business in terms of its operations are not doing well. The only good part of this report, in my opinion, is the daily active, monthly active users. They're keeping engagement up, even in the competition of YouTube and in the competition of TikTok. That is the highlight. But other than that, the financial aspect of this company, I did not like this report. It makes me wonder, just in general, is social media a good business? Is this one that we should be investing in? Year to date, Meta's down 53% because of competition and different problems. All time, it's up 316%. So it's done really well, but, but Facebook was one of the most unique stocks and one of the best performing ones above others in the social media industry. We can look at other examples here. Snapchat's down 61% from its IPO. All time, investors have lost money in the social media company. 
Twitter is down 12% from IPO. All time, not only have investors lost 12%, but they've lost massive opportunity cost. Staying invested in this company instead of the general market or many other opportunities. Twitter's yet another social media company that's been disappointing. Pinterest, another social media company that since IPO is in the red all time. Meta is one of the only ones that's in the green all time, and even then it's with extreme volatility. So it does make me question the extent of how much I wanna be invested into social media platforms altogether. Having said that, I'll need to wait and look at their guidance. I'll need to look at more information before making any decisions about Meta. But as of right now, with the limited knowledge that I have, I was not happy with this earnings report. I think it was a complete disappointment, especially compared to Google, which operates in a similar industry. So that's all for today. We had one crazy day in the market. Now we're at $33,400 in gains. In one day, we went up 2.99%. That's a $10,000 gain, 10 grand in a single day. That's all for this episode. I hope you enjoyed a quick look at all these earnings reports. Let me know what you think in the comments below if you have any questions. And I'll have another video out this week. So subscribe to the channel with the bell icon and I'll see you in the next one.